Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 67 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome listeners, and Ramadan Mubarak, because uh, last time we were recording, we were just at the, right about to start Ramadan, and now here we are, all three of us fasting. Yeah. So, <laughs> depending on depending on when they hear it... That's true. It, I, it'll well, be... I mean, I'm going to push you to at least get this posted in Ramadan. All right, it'll be the the, <laughs> the midpoint. Pro, pro, there you go. Of Ramadan. There you go. Yeah. Uh, inshallah, fingers. Yeah. Crossed. No, it's been great. Uh, how's your Ramadan been going so far? Uh, it's been uneventful. Yeah. So that's that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, th- these have been long days, so it it has been somewhat challenging in more ways than one. Uh, yeah, definitely, and. Uh, I think we have a, a guest today that uh, can maybe speak on some timely issues that uh, probably hit the, uh, the, he- the 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 uh, headlines of late. Yeah, it's it's uh, sometimes sometimes these things just sort yeah. of time out where we had we had booked this a while ago, but but just kind of li- real life intervened and made this uh, much more timely than it already was. Uh, so our guest for this episode is Ahmed Nassar, who's president of NFL Players Incorporated, the National Football League Players Association's licensing and marketing business. He oversees all operations of this company that takes in $175 million a year. He leads commercial negotiations with the NFL and other key partners and frequently works with the Players Associations of other professional sports on business and legal issues of mutual importance. Ahmed co-founded and launched Athlete Content and Entertainment a startup company focused on delivering athlete lifestyle content across all media as well as the One Team Collective. He received a Sports Business Journal's prestigious 40 Under 40 Award and taught sports law at Georgetown University. That was a lot to read, and I have Ramadan mouth, so I'm (laughs) amazed I got through it. But, Ahmed, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, And, uh, I mean, a part that Zaki uh, didn't discuss, but you are a lawyer by training, uh, and uh, I think prior to law school, you did your undergrad in Near Eastern Studies? Yep. Yeah, uh, so we have Econ some. and Near Eastern Studies. Econ yeah. and yeah. Near Eastern Studies. Yeah. Okay, great. So we can maybe get into some of that as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I guess before we get into anything too topical, uh, I'd love to kind of just talk about your background, uh, where you hail from, and, and maybe like where your parents came from, wh- yeah. I mean, how they came, and... Uh, you know, your origin story, as we like to say. Yeah. Uh, my parents came by plane from <laughs> Egypt, <laughs> um, in the, uh, late seventies. And my dad is, uh, engineer and he was doing his PhD at the university of Cincinnati. So I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> um, and then we moved to Michigan. The Browns are, yeah. yeah. Is, is it the Browns? Is yeah. That, <laughs> it, it's, it's, well, not the Browns. Yeah. What am I saying? The Bengals. The Bengals, yeah, the yeah, Browns, yeah. Ohio State. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all, yeah. my kids were so disappointed to find out that I'm, that I'm from Ohio, um, when they found that out. Um, so we moved to Michigan when I was two or three. Uh, so I grew up in Michigan, um, first half of my childhood in Livonia, which is a suburb of Detroit, and then um, second half in high school in, uh, or just really high school in Northville, um, and then went to the University of Michigan for undergrad. Um, And uh, after Michigan, went to the University of Chicago for law school, and then I've been in D.C. or the D.C. area pretty much ever since um, 2003. Basically. Was your dad involved in the uh, auto industry? Was that what he, he was No, so he oh. taught, um, oh, cool. and he teaches still mechanical engineering uh, at Oakland University, oh, which yeah. is in, even though we're near Oakland, California, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's in Oakland County, Michigan. Which is um, one of the more affluent counties of, yeah, of, of, yeah. of certainly Southeast Michigan. And, and pretty oh. much 100 yards from the world headquarters of Chrysler, right. and then de- you know a few miles from Ford and, and right. GM. So he's consulted over the years. And actually right now he's, um, uh, doing a visiting professorship in the university of Turin in Italy. Oh, wow. And so we're going to go, uh, our family's going to go visit him, uh, at the end of June, uh, after Ramadan. So and mechanical, he teaches he's mechanical saying, engineering. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned Oakland County. A lot of people who aren't from Michigan or haven't visited don't really, don't know, but have heard of like eight mile road, for example, and eight mile road is the D de- is the demarcation line. So my, my parents still live off of eight mile road. There you go. But about 20 like miles. The M&M, like, of M&M, M&M fame. The M&M, yeah. M&M fame. And, and it, it, it represents, I mean, it represents a lot of things, but, but geographically speaking, it is the dividing line between Oakland County, which is relatively white, very affluent, and Detroit County. Yeah. Which is the opposite. Mm-hmm. So, and, and if you if yeah. you draw if you take out a map and draw a line across the state of Michigan, That's right. it's also the dividing line between Illinois and Wisconsin. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just literally extended the line across Lake Michigan 
right. to <laughs> divide the state right. lines. And yeah. so hence Eight Mile Road then becomes this kind of buffer between this sort of very affluent mm-hmm. white neighborhood or neighborhoods in southeast Michigan and then Detroit. Sure. And hence a lot of what Eminem talks about is his experiences living in that mm-hmm. yeah. buffer, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, which so is it, a lot of poor white. It drove my wife crazy yeah. because for years when we moved to the East Coast, I would say, yeah. I'm from Detroit or the Detroit area. Oh, yeah. And, and I would say, you know, I grew up right off of Eight Mile Road, which is factually true. It's just 25 miles west of the Detroit city limit. And so she didn't appreciate that because she's from Flint. Oh, and okay. she's like, well, that's not... That's not Detroit. Exa- it doesn't mean what you are implying, but it was okay. I got some I got some cool points out of it when <laughs> I moved to the East Coast. You know, I, I share that because I, I lived in Michigan too. And so for me, and I, and I moved there from Houston where Houston's got this huge border. So anything within like 50 miles is considered Houston, whether your address says Houston proper or not. Mm-hmm. So like, for example, if you're in Sugarland, people will say, I'm from Houston. Nobody says I'm from Sugarland. Or maybe that's changed in the last 10 years, but it was certainly when I grew up there. Um, and so when I moved to Michigan, I used to, I used to tell people, yeah, yeah, I, I live in Detroit. And then people, used to, people, actually Michiganders would correct me and say, no, you live in, you know, Canton. You live, you know, actually closer to Ann Arbor than you do, you know, to Detroit. And so that becomes a real sort of cultural thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so for listeners of the show, you know, if you go back and listen to, say, the, the episode we had with, I remember, uh, Imam Munir Farid, mm-hmm. or Dr. Munir Farid, um, he, we, we, we got in a lot about that in terms mm-hmm. of some of the racial dynamics of what Michigan and the community there and how that all sort of plays out. But uh, I'm sorry, we got into this tangent on, on, on Michigan. But uh, Yeah, you, come on. Yeah. <laughs> this ain't no movie. There ain't no Mackay Pfeiffer. <laughs> That's all I know from that song. <laughs> From one song of, of, of an Eminem, of, from one Eminem song. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, sorry. So uh, you graduate law school. Do, do you practice law for a while? Uh, I did practice law yeah. for a while. Before I left law school, I took a class with then Professor Barack Obama. And wow. uh, that he was, was interesting. There. That was he was there. Tenure. He was running. He had just started his campaign for U.S. Senate gotcha. when I had him. Um and it was actually quite a long shot at the time. If you remember, Jim Ryan was kind of um, well, a heavy favorite. Jim yeah. Ryan connection and Obama. You make that great story with, with like the fall of Jim Ryan. Yeah, and the whole divorce. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not for him. Yeah. If well, not, his wife. Right? His, his, his wife was yeah. seven of nine on Jer- Star Trek. Jerry, Jerry Ryan. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And if that controversy had not erupted. Absolutely. And it's, if Jack, is Jim Ryan, Jack Ryan, I guess. It was right. Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan. Right? I don't know. He might have, uh, yeah. I don't know. Or maybe went by yeah. Jim. Anyway, yeah. if he hadn't stepped down. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's extraordinary because it's. Because you traced it all back to Jerry. What's her name? I Ryan. did. I was just like, <laughs> it's all yeah. seven of nine is why, you know. Why right. They crazy. unsealed the divorce records. And once they did that, it was like, whoa, this guy's crazy. And yeah. that's, I mean, in, in life, right? It's like talent. And just dumb luck. Absolutely. Because who could have predicted? I mean, you yeah. know, it's extraordinary. Right. Absolutely. Right. You know? So it goes to your and, point and, about... And Mike Ditka, they were trying to recruit the former coach of the Chicago Bears... To run. To make an thing. NFL connection, to run. And he said later on that it was the greatest regret in his life that he didn't run because he thought that he single-handedly could have prevented an Obama presidency, which is pretty hilarious. <laughs> this is all like sort of the, yeah, the, you know, uh, what is it, the... The, the alternate world that comic yeah, books yeah, 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 yeah. Or sliding or doors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. That's right. <laughs> wow. So, anyway, we all we went down this little rabbit hole because you said, uh, at that time, a long shot, Obama. Yeah. But he was teaching constitutional law. Yep. And you took con law with yeah, him. Yeah, it was like a 20, 25-person yeah. seminar. Right. And... Yeah. Was it just con law, or did he teach? It was. Like, uh, it was specific. It was equal protection and due process. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so it was like an advanced con law class, not your basic, right. you know, one or two L yeah. uh, and, constitutional and class. For going hindsight, I mean, just what were your impressions of him as a professor? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I took it as either a two L or a three L. Yeah, I took it as a three L. Yeah, so and you were graduating, you had been yeah. to law school already. For, yeah. for the for all practical. Purposes. He, I found him, and and frankly, still find him to be incredibly sincere and smart. Um, and just a good person, the kind of person you would want to teach your kids. Mm-hmm. Um, funny enough, uh, most law school professors uh, are tenured and and they do it full time. And so by virtue of that, they say all kinds of crazy hypotheticals that are usually highly entertaining to law students. Okay. Um, because President Obama was a an adjunct and 
you know, working full time as a state senator at the time, he didn't do that. And so he was more kind of playing it down the middle. And in fact, you could probably have read transcripts of his classes and not necessarily in, on some issues mm-hmm. have picked out, well, is he, is he liberal? Is he mm-hmm. conservative? Because he didn't view that as his place to really put his, in now his yeah, job. in his day job, I, you know, of course he, he had his views on all of those issues, but in the context of the classroom setting, he made it a point to not kind of make it a political thing, which I thought was, was interesting. And in, in hindsight, I respect that a lot. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, so approaching to things academically, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, dispassionately mm-hmm. as it were, which is not only that as a, not only as, as someone you want teaching your kids, but just as a, in terms of skills that lawyers eventually have to master, mm-hmm. which is to approach things dispassionately. So in that sense, um, yeah, I mean, my, my closest to the story to that is, you know, I went to the university of Arkansas for law school and, um, it was years after Hillary and Bill taught there, but we used to hear stories about during their tenure, you know, like there was this very famous story of Bill Clinton losing as a first year professor, losing that entire classes. He taught con law that year and he lost the, all of the exams. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, that That's, became kind of a famous story in, in, the, in, the, in the quarters of the law school. Yeah. Uh, and then Hillary Clinton, Clinton, and she had her stories. But they met there. They got they married in Fayetteville. But um, anyway, sorry, go, going back to you. Um, so then you practiced law. You actually practiced law. Yeah, I spent a year actually back in Detroit, yeah, right. in, in Detroit proper, um, clerking Clerky. for Denise Page Hood, who's now the chief judge um, of the Eastern District of uh, uh, Michigan. Mm-hmm. She was appointed by Bill Clinton in 94. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, she's somebody I'm still actually very close to, and my brother clerked for her a few years later, and a Muslim woman that we are friends with clerked for her a few years after that, and she's basically like a second mother to all of us. And in fact, when President Obama was getting uh, sworn in, she came uh, and stayed at our house and then took us with her and her husband. Um, she had gotten tickets, um, and tickets were hard to come by for that for that inauguration, mm-hmm. not so much recent uh, inaugurations. Um, and, uh, so we, we, the, my wife and I and Judge Hood and her husband went to, uh, the inauguration in January of 2009. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. I, I was, I, my, my, again, my closest to that is, uh, I was at the rally at, at Grand Park in Chicago. Uh-huh. The night, uh, the night yeah, of, yeah, amazing. the night they won the election. And yeah, we were at a mutual friend's house, Suzuki, you know, yeah. and we're Sultan's house. And the, the minute they called Virginia, we were maybe about 10 miles outside the city and we, we, we took a train into the city because it awesome. was inevitable at that yeah. point. Yeah. And uh, it was amazing to be in that crowd of 2 million people. And yeah, it was... It was, it was so when I moved yeah. to the D.C. area, we, for reasons I don't quite know, moved to Virginia, the Virginia side. Mm-hmm. So there's sort of people live in Maryland, people live in Virginia, people live in D.C. proper. Right. And most of my friends are fairly liberal types and they live in DC or Maryland. And so they were like, why are you living in Virginia? And why are you living in the South? And the night, um, Obama won, I said, this is why I live in a swing state. My vote actually counted. So, um, and now Virginia has been fairly reliably blue and my home state has (laughs) gone the other way, unfortunately. So hopefully only temporarily. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I hope. Although Michigan has been, I think in recent years, been a swing state, right? They call it no, that, but I mean, state, I, I don't know if you're yeah, Michigan, Michigan, Michigan Ohio. not Ohio. No, okay. I, I, although Ohio I have no plays. recollection of ever living in Ohio, so I just although Ohio doesn't pay yeah. or play any less of a significant role. That's right. In recent elections. I mean, That's right. Certainly, we can go back to the uh, 04 election where Ohio yeah. won Bush a re-election. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, Bush Jr. Um, but anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, we'll. I guess it, we'll see what plays out in the Rust Belt, but uh, I know Michigan. Well, to, to be honest, I, this actually allows for kind of a, a segue yeah. to to the events of today before we pivot because it's true. because uh, you we, know we're we talking kind of buried the lead yeah here. I mean I mean because <laughs> we're talking about the swing states and and sort of uh, uh, playing to the demographic there and obviously President Trump has made a lot of hay out of out of uh, these protests that have been going on uh, by by players who are kneeling during the national anthem so that. Uh, in response to that, the NFL released n- a new rule today, which the NFL owners, NFL mm-hmm. owners, yeah. which I, uh, I'm correct me if I have it wrong, but that essentially players, if players are on the field, they cannot kneel in protest. However, players are not required to 
be on the field. Right. So that yeah, that's right. That's basically right. What what they wrote is uh, all personnel, including players on the field during the anthem, must show respect. That's the key word. Show uh, respect. Um, but unlike previously, they do not have to be on the field during the anthem. Okay. And so my guess, and this is just a guess, is that they are thinking if somebody doesn't want to stand, they're free to stay inside the right. locker room and not stand. Right. Uh, and they did that unilaterally today, this morning. Um, they didn't bargain with the union. They didn't discuss with um, uh, players before implementing that rule. Um, interestingly, in the two hours after they announced it, the owner of the San Francisco 49ers, not far from here, mm-hmm. Jed York, said he abstained from the vote. Um, and they kind of made it seem it was like a unanimous decision. They did. Decision. They said it was unanimous. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I guess it still technically was. If you abstained. He, right. he didn't vote. And then the owner the, of the um, New York Jets, a uh, guy named Chris Johnson, um, whose brother is Woody Johnson, who is the um, current ambassador to the United Kingdom uh, for the Trump administration. Hmm. Um, Chris Johnson said that he uh, would not find any of his players for um, kneeling, and if they if they were to be fined by the league, mm-hmm. that he would pay for it. Wow. So this is just in two hours after um, announcing um, the new rule. And um, Malcolm Jenkins, who um, is a notable player for the uh, Philadelphia Eagles, won the Super Bowl um, this year. You're right. And um, he didn't kneel. He he raised a fist. And so there were questions about, well, he's standing. Is that is that showing respect or not? And different people had different views on that already. So I, I, my guess is we're going to hear a lot more about what, what this new rule means. Um, but he also issued a statement saying that he will, will not be silenced by any rule. And, and um, he's looking forward to continuing to work on behalf of the causes and shining a light on, on the issues that, that he cares about and that many other pl- uh, players care about. I think it's really interesting that right before I walked in here, uh, Milwaukee Bucks uh, and basketball player yeah. um, who had been arrested in January outside of a Walgreens, right. they released the body cam footage um, from the police, and and um, it, it's as bad as people thought, where he wasn't escalating the situation at all and finds himself tasered and handcuffed and arrested, um, and then ends up obviously not being charged with anything um, other than a parking citation. Hmm. Um, and the Milwaukee Bucks issued a rip roaring statement supporting him and how, the, based on the footage, um, he you know was clearly assaulted and you know it was unacceptable and, and it just what an interesting contrast on the same exact day right. that in the morning we have the NFL unilaterally um, promulgating a new rule um, that in their view you know cleans up you know and I'm using air quotes yeah. uh, the anthem issue. And, uh, and in the afternoon, we have an NBA team, you know, vocally and vehemently supporting um, one of its African American players who who dealt with, right. um, you know, police, hand, yeah. pre- police brutality. Yeah, that's right. Now, uh, you, this like, you, you you mentioned twice how this was a unilateral move. Um, you know, can I ask how common or uncommon that is for? you know, these kind of rules to come down from the top down without any well, negotiations with the players? Yeah, so um, it, it depends on the issue, and, and I, you know, I don't want to... You know, I was just going to say, maybe before that, for this, again, for the sake of our listeners, I mean, including myself, I mean, maybe kind of give us an idea of how, uh, like, you know, like your role within yeah. the organization that you serve um, as president, like, how does that kind of fit into the, like, how's yeah, the league so, organized? Right, so I run, okay, so there's yeah. the NFL. Right. And they're the league, right? The National Football League. And so they're basically the trade association for these 32 um, independently owned and operated NFL football businesses, the teams. Got it. And so the league kind of does the scheduling and the TV broadcast sales and this national sponsorship. But then each team does their own season ticket sales and bobblehead promotions and giveaways and, um, you know, what the stadium looks like and all that. Um, and then separate from that, like a lot of workforces are, the players are unionized Okay. and the NFLPA is the labor union for the employees of each of those teams, right. which is, uh, the players. And, um, the union does all the things that union does, uh, do like collectively bargain over wages, hours, working conditions, um, and that sort of thing. Um, and 
our union's no different in that. Um, we also represent our individual members in um, uh, disputes disputes with their employer. Right. So when Michael Vick had a criminal issue right. related to dog fighting, mm-hmm. we don't represent him criminally, right, and in the defense posture as against um, criminal uh, charges. We represented him with respect to the Atlanta Falcons right. and any kind of discipline that they imposed or the league imposed. Similarly, you know, even though it wasn't a criminal matter, Tom Brady allegedly deflated footballs. Deflate game. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's a Michigan man, so there's no way he possibly could have <laughs> done anything untoward. Um, but we represented him in that right. matter as well. Um, and, and, you know, Ray Rice and Adrian Peterson and, and any kind of individual player matter as it relates to the employee discipline, mm. right? And um, so separate from that, the union owns a wholly owned subsidiary that runs... Um, the commercial business on behalf of the players. Gotcha. It generates revenue right. on behalf of the players. And that's a unique wrinkle that most unions don't have. The UAW doesn't have a separate for-profit subsidiary because it doesn't have membership that, you know, I mean, I'm from Michigan, so that would lend I love also. UAW members, but yeah, they're, they're not exactly going to sell t-shirts or video games. And, and so we do that, and, and the business that I run now um, does that on behalf of the players. And the revenue that we generate all goes back to the players and it also goes to fund the entirety of the union's operating budget every single year. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So, so when we talk about licensing, merchandising, uh, endorsements, that kind of thing, yep. and you're negotiating on behalf of individual players. Yep, exactly. And so, yeah. I mean, just earlier today I was meeting with EA and their CEO, wow. they make the popular Madden video games That's right. and they're, I think they are our single biggest licensee. Really? Yeah. Out of, Probably eighty that, that makes sense. Really, among yeah. other games, I think. Madden, yeah, there's obviously their yeah, Ma- yeah, Madden, FIFA, shift. FIFA is their biggest game. Oh, okay. uh, Madden is is uh, their second, right. and those are you know their sports titles are annual, so yeah. it's, it's it's basically like an annuity. Whereas their Star Wars game, you know, that comes out every two, three years, right. four years, um, and other games are kind of like that as well. So, okay. okay. Um, so as it relates to the anthem yeah, issue, that's right. Um, you know, actually, Andrew and I spent a decent amount of time talking about it this morning because the news had broken right after. But, you know, it impacts business across the board. Mm-hmm. You know, during the season when President Trump was, was tweeting and talking about the anthem issue, and oh, by the way, he already... Getting um, those SOBs off the court, yeah, et cetera. Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah, and he's oh, already declared victory so? today, right? He, he, oh, really? To no, use I, it, yeah. He, he and Mike tweet. Pence oh. um, both tweeted. Actually, I think Mike Pence tweeted uh, hashtag winning. And uh, which is quoting just Charlie amazing. Sheen. It's know, just amazing. Right. And and then President Trump retweeted it's, it's, it. We're, we're through the looking glass. It really, I, 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 like, yeah. One of them is going to say tiger blood, and I'll be like, all right, it's all over, <laughs> you know. But I mean, th- this whole issue yeah. was kind of it became. It, I mean, it got ginned up almost out of a whole cloth <clears throat> by the president into an anti-American issue, as opposed to a hey, let's shed light on this police brutality 100 percent. if you think back to when he raised it when he made the comment of let's get these sons of bitches off uh the field mm-hmm. i don't know what rating your podcast is so hopefully you can that's blur- a, unfortunately you can- that's a direct quote from the yeah, yeah. We're gonna that's world, true so yeah, that's true so but you can you can blurt it out you no, can no, blur no, it out later, yeah. i mean well, he to- said it yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> thank you uh, that's, yeah. that, that's true my son learned new words during <laughs> the campaign uh, because of what was in the newspaper. Yeah. I have to explain to my daughters yeah. what hush money to a porn star means. So. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different things. There's so many words different there that things. Back. Yeah. Hush money, porn star. Yeah. Just, yeah. Right? Uh, anyway, yeah. Um, We're all fasting too. So anyway, yeah. go on. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. He raised, yeah. he raised that issue at a political rally in Alabama during that Senate campaign, the Roy Moore and yeah. um, mm. the Doug Jones Senate Doug campaign. Jones. Well, the interesting thing about Alabama is there are no NFL teams in Alabama. Hmm. So what are we doing, to your point about ginning up the issue, yeah. uh, Zeki? Like, these aren't people who are going to an NFL game the next day. That's right. And to bring it up out of left field, you know, to borrow a baseball yeah. metaphor, <laughs> I mean, that's that's just, it, it, it absolutely, you know, struck everybody as, well, and, and more than a year after Colin Kaepernick had, First right. started kneeling, and and halfway into a season in which Colin Kaepernick was and remains unemployed, right? So right. it it um, and by that point the protests, you know, the number of players kneeling was 
Yeah. You, you, under 10. That's right. It was you're right. Um, and That's what you saw after was an explosion in I mean, it. I mean, unfortunately, the president, by virtue of finding these kinds of issues, he knows... How, I mean, he knows what place to his base. And it's effective to whatever extent. I mean, you know, because you create a... A, a conflict that wasn't really there, and then you get to claim victory, mm-hmm. right? Because suddenly this is a thing that needs to be solved. I, I agree with that. I will admit, uh, and I have to be careful because we were talking about this before you started recording. Mm-hmm. So I obviously have my own personal views on this that that I can't fully get into, um, but they're there and they're actually quite strong, as you both know. Um, but uh, I will admit that a, a, as a Collective, and I'll put more of the emphasis on the league. Um, you know, the league bungled this, I think, by sure. by and by their own admission. I I, I think mm. by letting this drag out and mm. drip 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 for as long as it has. Mm. Um, and it's an interesting thought experiment to say, well, if the rule that they unilaterally pushed out this morning had been pushed out or discussed a year and a half ago, how different would the world look? Because I think it would probably look pretty different. Hmm. Um, and and hmm. so that that's a uh, you know because because here's the contrast you know I already compared to the NBA once the NBA has a rule that all players must stand during the anthem mm-hmm. and yet is anyone today going to sit here and tell me that NBA players somehow care less about these social justice issues than NFL players hmm. simply because they don't kneel during the anthem I don't think so right. so it's you know, and 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 the, the NFL players have been very clear. It's never supposed to be about the kneeling, uh, or whatever form of r- fist raising, whatever form of protest during the anthem. It was supposed to be about the issues that they were trying to raise awareness exactly. around. That's right. Exactly. And and that obviously it's got purposely obscure. twisted. It's, it's yeah. Been, uh, you know, I mean, the vice president attended a. Game. He made a big show oh, of yeah. attending the game and, and walking then, out and walking out, and yeah. he knew what he was going to do. Absolutely. So, in other words, like. Th- you know, you can talk about a player kneeling on the court, on the field, excuse me, and that's not costing the people who are watching the game anything. Mike Pence flying over and planning to walk out. Well, all of that production comes out of our pocket, our collective taxpayer pocket. That's a good point. Right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's a great point. I, um, I, was gonna, uh, I forgot where I was going to go, but... Uh, oh, right. What about all... Like, I, I remember also... After the president's made after the president made his remarks, there was some showing of solidarity among the NFL players and the and the owners sure. who also took a knee. Um, when was that? And was that just optics? Now at, it, it it was in the immediate aftermath right. of that. And in fact, I think if I if my memory is correct, President Trump said this on a Friday night at a rally in Alabama. Mm-hmm. The first game NFL game after that was uh, Sunday morning, and it was I believe a London game. In which the Jacksonville Jaguars, owned by Shahid Khan, that's yes, right. That's right. were playing. Yeah. I forgot the team, and he went on the field and linked arms. I've and seen the picture. many players knelt during the national anthem. Well, during the Star Spangled Banner, and then stood up during "God Save the Queen," which is like an interesting contrast because you know they were like, "Well, we're we're guests in in the United Kingdom. Yeah. I guess we should stand for their thing." But um, and you saw more of that throughout that day and, and continuing into the next week or two. Um, and by the end of the season, that, that sort of thing had kind of started. And you started seeing teams link arms mm-hmm. during the national anthem, which is another question. So is that is I that showing respect. respect or not? What, what, right. You know, who's going to decide and How what is it based on? How are we defining respect and who is defining respect? Yeah. yeah. Jed York made a point that I absolutely loved, which is he said um, because of the way the rule is drafted – um, it says all personnel. It doesn't. It's not player specific, but obviously, mm-hmm. what they were trying to get at is the players. And so he said, "Well, you know, I, I'm going to make it a point to make sure that um, our concession employees aren't selling during the national anthem. Mm-hmm. Which right now, if you go to a game, if you happen to be in uh, the concourse during the anthem, oh, yeah. and you're buying your popcorn or your hot dog or your your pretzel, yeah. you, you, they're still transacting. Dur- and so he said, "Well, it just seems odd to me, and it doesn't seem like we're showing respect." If we're generating revenue during during the national anthem, <laughs> and and I, I just th- there's all sorts of like you know unintended consequences mm-hmm. um, around that, and and I think the biggest thing for the players was um, they just weren't a part of it during the season. Mm-hmm. There had been several meetings and and you know covered in the press um, between players and owners and players and and Roger Goodell, who's the commissioner, 
uh, of the NFL and he's sort of like the CEO of the mm -hmm. NFL and the owners of the teams are, are his board of directors is the easiest way to think about that. And, um, you know, they, they had been supportive and they had talked about making a financial commitment to a lot of these issues, mm -hmm. um, which some people had called in the question at the time, like, what are you, are, you, are you trying to, you know, donate money to get players to stand or, you know, how's this going to work? Um, and I think a lot of those players are very disappointed now today to see that, you know, those discussions didn't really pan out the way that they had hoped. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, our thing as the NFLPA is even at the height that weekend, we had 200 plus players kneel across the league. Well, that's basically 10% of the league. And we represent all 100%. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that our players rightly, because we work for them, have said is, look, you know, you want to defend or we need to defend Tom Brady deflated footballs, mm -hmm. allegedly. Uh, Ray Rice, um, you know, uh, double jeopardy, yeah, right? right. Um, not not the action that led to to that, but but the way that, that the discipline was handed out. Mm -hmm. That's all fine, and we should do that. But these political things get to be, you know, and that was the way that that some players internalized it. And so we have to be careful because we do we don't only represent the players who kneel mm -hmm. or the players who stand. We represent all of them. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is an issue that you know in their locker rooms. And to the point you made, Zeki, about taxpayer dollars, you know, the players say, well, we're all, we're all members of the union and we all pay membership dues. So, you know, we need to make sure we're not anti-Trump, quote unquote, mm. or, you know, pro-Obama. We, we just have to make sure that, okay, we're a labor union. Yeah. There are some political issues related to labor law that we can absolutely take positions on. Yeah. But, you know, in a broader context and societally, that's not necessarily how the players view our role as an organization. That's right. That's right. I mean, to, to the point you're making, I think it's sad, and it's a sad statement about where we're at right now, where everything, everything has become an anti-Trump or a pro-Trump issue. I mean, football should not be political, mm -hmm. and yet here we are, right? And it's it's just, it's this toxic politicization of everything. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, where we stand right now... Um, I'm pretty sure most of the folks on the left are unhappy with the NFL. Huh. And I'm I just walking in, I had a guy that everybody knows, including I think a lot of the people listening to this podcast, text me that he thinks he's done with the NFL. Like huh. he's just, he can't, he can't. And this is a diehard uh, fan for years and years and years and he's had season tickets and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but then, then you have folks yeah. from Michigan, Ohio, Alabama, who are already scarred by what they viewed last year as this political circus. Right. Um, well, and, and they're issue. unhappy. Right. right. And it's like, well, if, if you have an issue like that where people on both sides are, are unhappy with the way you're handling it, you, you're probably not doing something right. Because hmm. you had all those uh, fans who were like burning thousands and thousands, mm -hmm. thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. Like I've been a lifelong I mean, Steelers fan, that? and I'm gonna yeah. burn my jacket. And you write, you know, we had people yeah. calling into oh, our I'm office sure. making death threats. We had people write all kinds of crazy, you know, right. movie serial killer, you know, cutting letters out of magazine type letters. And wow, it's just that's nice. crazy. Yeah, right. right. Wow. Um, I, I guess speaking to it, I mean, maybe discussing an issue that's not as political, but certainly, I know was in the zeitgeist for a moment. There was. Um, you know the issue around uh, injuries, player injuries, yeah. and the, you know what was the movie with Will Smith? Uh, concussion, 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 right? Right. Yeah. They kind of talked about the real life experiences <clears throat> of certain NFL players. Um, now that's certainly something that would be within the uh, wheelhouse of the uh, of the PA. Right? Oh, absolutely, right, absolutely. Right. And to what extent? And, and so when we start, I, I started. What was that? Was that I, the late night? Uh, the 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 movie. Not the movie, yeah. but I guess like a lot of those the litigation, issues. The, yeah. Well, the litigation really cranked up yeah. um, seven, eight years ago, right? Um, and 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 uh, resulted in a settlement that is still actually being fought over. Okay. Um, and That's what I was when, to. so actually, back to your very first question about like my my background, I practiced law out of law school mm -hmm. um, in D.C. at a couple of different corporate law firms and um, met a guy who is now the executive director um, of the union and, and the chairman of my board. Okay. Uh, his name's DeMoris Smith. And um, D, and he goes by D, D and I um, started working together in 2003. So we've now worked together for, for 15 years. And when Obama won, 
um, or looked like he was going to win. D was actually Eric Holder's number two at the Department of Justice oh, wow. in the 90s mm. and worked with a guy named Robert Mueller um, uh, also at the time. And, and also at some point... Who um, went on to no distinction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> never heard of him Poor after guy, that. Working that. Cars somewhere. Just faded into oblivion. Yeah. Um, and at some point, uh, apparently, came into contact with Jim Comey, who was working in Richmond, Virginia. So it's like a really interesting group there. And um, so D was getting ready to do something in the Obama administration, either be the U.S. attorney in D.C., like Eric had been, um, or something in the Department of Justice, um, like a deputy attorney general, that sort of thing. And my thing was, well, I'd already gone from one law firm to another with D, and, right. you know, and I had been, you know, a lot of my... I wasn't active on any of the campaigns, um, but pretty much half of my class had uh, the, that, that seminar had uh, gone on to work in uh, President Obama's oh. Senate office and in his presidential campaign. Okay. So this seemed like an interesting and cool way to like, you know, I was done with law firms by that point. Yeah. You know, it probably lasted more than most people <laughs> in a law firm environment. <laughs> and um, yeah. so that was the plan. The plan was to go into government. And I literally had a note on my phone of all the expenses I was going to cut because I was going to take a pay cut to go be like a prosecutor or something. And one of the things on there was my NFL Sunday ticket package because I figured how could I justify spending 300 bucks right. on this direct TV Sunday ticket package, you know, to watch my Detroit Lions lose every week. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, uh, he got a call out of the blue for, from a search firm, uh, for the executive director job uh -huh. and, uh, ended up pursuing that. And, and, you know, it was like a six month long process. And, you know, in the meantime, we were balancing transition team calls with, you know, um, uh, prepping for um, these interviews. Mm -hmm. And he was one of 200 candidates that they put together um, around Halloween of 08. And by March of 09, he had gotten the job. Mm -hmm. And so I joined him not long after that um, at the NFLPA. So it became this huge left turn, but it was, it was just out of, you know, we were, to your earlier point about that, like, what are you talking about? Well, it's interesting <laughs> from one D to another uh, that we were going to, record with you maybe a year ago or maybe six months ago and it was, it was going to be you and david kelly it was the week of the election oh wow it was okay. the week of the election and it was like the day or two after the yeah. election i was actually looking back because i oh, i dug up an old email to yeah, reply that's to right. you that's right you dug and, up that same thread yep and uh -huh. and and i was looking at the date and i think it was literally the thursday wow. after the tuesday wow. election we were, and we were going to record in Oakland, and yep. David Kelly uh, was going to join us, yeah. yep. uh, who also was starting, started off as general counsel there, but then went yeah. to VP of uh, business, uh, I forget what his current position Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he's no he's on the, he's yeah. on the business side as well. That's where the fun's are. Uh, David Kelly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who, <laughs> future guests will have. Yeah, you but, you yeah. mentioned, I, w I, wanna, I, w I was wondering if you could unpack this real briefly. You mentioned being done with law firms, and how you lasted yeah. more than many people. I'm very curious, because I have a feeling a lot of people listening don't really have an insight into that. Like, is it just heavy burnout factor and why? Yeah, it's so... And you should know, like, I think every person that we've had on the show that, that, that has a law background no longer practices. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's yeah. a badge of and, and by the way, I say that, and, and, and yeah. so a couple things. I, I, I Including I, the co-host of the show. So, like... Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, say this usually tongue-in-cheek, right. you know, because, like, when people will say, well, are you practicing law now? I say, oh, no, I recovered. <laughs> Recovering and, attorney. And, and after, after President Trump won the election and after watching friends go to airports um, during the Muslim ban, I said, you know, I'm not going to make that joke anymore because sure. this is, like, yeah. a renaissance in, like, the utility of lawyers, of hopefully. Lawyers. So, yeah, right. so and, I, and, in, and by and large, they have my respect. And my brother is a partner at a law firm. My brother-in-law is a partner at a law firm. So I don't think they'll listen to this, but, but, um, you know, so it's no disrespect to anybody who's still practicing sure, law, sure. even in a big corporate context. But I will say, and, and the irony is we employ, um, my old law firm as one of our outside counsel now. Right. And some of the partners that used to be my bosses are now on the receiving end of calls from me saying, Hey, I need this or that. Right. And, you know, it was kind of a funny thing in the beginning where they were like, you know, I remember when you were a summer associate. And I'd say, yeah. So I really do still need that that thing, though. So, right. um, you know, if you could get that to me. And um, but I, I think, you know, the, the the legal practice in what they call big law, capital B, capital L, mm -hmm. is it's it's kind of similar to like pro football in the sense that like the average tenure is like probably less than four years. They wow. they 
they pay you well, but they kind of chew you up and spit you out. Oh, yeah. They don't really develop you. And, and it was a challenge when we got to the NFLPA because when you are a mid-level associate uh, all the way up to a partner and you are having a junior person do work for you, there is no reason for you to coach them up or manage them. Because if Zeki's not cutting it, then I'll just never work with Zeki again. I'm going to move on to Pervez. And if Pervez is doing a great job, then you're my guy. I'm going to keep working with you. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to a normal corporate environment, well, that's not because in a law firm, 40, 50 Ivy League educated lawyers are coming in every single year. Exactly. And, And it's sort of like a pyramid, right? Like you come in and over time people, you know, just go do other things. A lot of people go and they're like, well, I'll just do this for a couple of years. Uh, I will cool yeah. my heels, yeah. pay off my student loans, figure exactly. out what I want to do next. And, and, and the law firms are fine with that. That's, right. That's actually kind of the thing. Like, if you stick around more than that, they're kind of like, yeah, well, that that's not the deal here, right? The deal was that you came in and got paid well, and, and then you, you go they do come. something else. That's right. and, and maybe come back, right? I mean, and, and one of the things I learned and one of the reasons... I thought I wanted, well, I did go into government when uh, uh, Obama won, was that I looked at the partners at at, um, the firm that I was at that I enjoyed working with and thought they did interesting work and brought in their own. I was big on, I don't want to be dependent on anybody else for business. And they all had government experience at some point. None of them just came in as a first year associate, worked eight years really, really hard, and then became partner. I mean, that happens sometimes. My brother-in-law and my brother are are both examples. Um, but in, in litigation and what I was doing, that's just not, people needed, you know, you to have real world experience of, well, I was a prosecutor for five years and I tried 167 cases. Okay. Like that's, that's my guy. Right. As opposed to, you know, I went to a good school and I've built 2,500 or 3000 hours uh, a year. And, And when your product, your output is time, I, I think that just messes with your mind <laughs> in a way that right. I don't know that is that healthy. Yeah. And, so. and by that he means like billable hours. Yeah, billable hours. Yeah, you're not yeah. building your widgets. You're, you're billing hours in exactly. six-minute increments. That's your output. And, and it makes you think about going to the bathroom. It makes you think about praying right in the middle of the day. You're thinking about, well, gee, you know, like I want to pray sunnah, but, you know, like that's three minutes. Like, I don't know. And, and it, it's, it, it just... Um, it wasn't for me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Long story short. No, I think I think that's really instructive for, for. I mean, certainly for me. I mean, that's that's not some a world I have a you, particular insight into. Yeah, but you know what's funny is, I it, it it's like eating your vegetables mm-hmm. when you're a kid. Like mm-hmm. it was good for me though. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think, mm-hmm. you know, I, I often say my best, my worst day now is better than my best day at at um, uh, the firms, and that's also tongue in cheek. But it it instilled a certain work ethic and kind of um, attention to detail. And we actually talk about it now that we wish we could send some of our junior staff people to the law firms, even the non-lawyers, just to work for six months. Like, go go work for six months and come back. And the perspective that that gives you, which I also think, you know, there was a time where we were really busy in 2015. Mm -hmm. And um, our HR um, folks were like, they, they, I don't, I mean, God bless them. I love them. And and they're, they're great at what they do. But like, they wanted to check on me. They were like worried and, and, um, they were like, Hey, we just want to make sure. Cause you've been busy with a bunch of stuff, you know, everything going okay. And I was like, well, well, yeah, I mean, my parents are from Egypt and you know, the upheaval that was going on then my wife's family's from Syria and they've lost like yeah. uncles and aunts and cousins. And they've all the, the, the remaining, uh, family members have scattered to the wind, right. From Germany to Italy, to, to the Gulf and to Jordan. And, and so I was like, yeah, I, I think this is okay, right? I mean, so that perspective, but it's hard for people who don't have that perspective. And then when you read these stories of like all the Me Too stuff and that's touched us um, with our relationship with Nike. And so Nike has had huge upheaval over the last mm-hmm. month wow. um, and had 12 plus um, senior level um, executives get forced out because of these issues. And, and I think people who don't have perspective like that when 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 their work becomes everything and it's and it their work is one thing yeah um it it really kind of distorts what um what the perspective should be so i've always thought that 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 experience of working in a law firm even though i'm glad i'm not still there um 
and I reserve the right to go back. <laughs> um, you know, it would just be I wouldn't be going back as a junior associate. I'd be going back as as um, partner as a partner. Yeah. Right. So um, you know that that is different. Um, but I, I think it was always helpful because it gave me that perspective and taught me some things that I think were were uh, and still are helpful hmm. in my career. Um, I think so. I had asked you about the uh, the. Uh, like the concussions and the, oh, yeah. the injury. Right? Yeah, so when yeah. we started in 09... Those the, cases. Yeah, at the time in 09, and this was in the movie, uh, the Will Smith movie, um, the NFL's um, stock line was that there's no... It was sort of like the old nicotine, right? There's right. no connection between smoking cigarettes and, and um, uh, cancer. And so their line was there's no connection between um, concussions and uh, later in life dementia and football and concussions, and it's all unproven science. And the scientist that, that um, the doctor that Will Smith was playing is Dr. Amalu. Um, and we, um, we actually had reached out to him and, and there were some congressional hearings and we had the luxury of being new. And so we took a really different tact and, and we, we, our executive director got up there and testified in front of Congress and said, we need to do better and there is a link and we're committed to trying to figure this out through rule changes, through cultural kind of education of players. Now, when you say we had the luxury of being new, what do you mean by that? You mean we were new to the organization. We ah, were new to yeah, football. Yeah. Okay. So we didn't have this 25-year, right. you know, like, well, I was the guy in 2000 who may have been kind of covering up some of this stuff. Pardon. We were brand new, and we were looking at it with fresh eyes. That's right. So it, it, it you know, I, I think it took a lot of courage for Dee to stand up uh, or sit in front of Congress and take the abuse and say that. But it also was easier given that we were five months into the job. Mm. And, wow. and, but we, we definitely meant it because when we were negotiating a collective bargaining agreement less than two years later with the NFL, we carved out $100 million to fund um, uh, not just concussion research, but all injury research. Um, and we are now working with Harvard on that. And we've developed all sorts of, well, Harvard has developed all sorts of uh, outstanding research that, you know, on ACL. Uh, repair, you know, from that knee injury, devastating right. knee injury that cost players seasons, mm-hmm. um, and and all sorts of concussion and rule recommendations, and it, it's it's a long process, um, but I think you'll see, um, and we've already seen a lot um, uh, of positive change as a result. I mean, players now self reporting uh, self reporting um, uh, potential concussions. That's a big deal right. um, because it used to be the culture of football that. You, you walked it off. You affirmatively hit it because you were afraid of losing your job, potentially. Right. And even though that's still a fear, I think we've made the point that, well, yeah, but your death, your suffering from dementia later on, your all sorts of health issues in between should probably trump whether you're going to start the next game or not. That's right. And I think we've, we've made a lot of progress there, but there's that's still more, more like to a do. cultural shift. Absolutely. Yeah, in the way, in the way and educa- I mean, one of the things, when the movie came out, mm-hmm. um, the league was unhappy with the movie and, and took issue with certain scenes and certain, you know, liberties that, that the producers may have taken with. Um, that was based on a book called League of Denial. Right. Um, and, and they didn't like the book. Mm-hmm. And we gave free tickets to every player in the league. To go uh, see the movie. To go see the movie. Yeah. We organized screenings for former players to go see the movie. And we worked with Sony, who, who put the movie out. Um, because we said, you can't change the culture if you're nitpicking, you know, in minute 76 of the movie... Artistic. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Amala was not wearing a blue shirt. He was actually wearing a white shirt. So how dare you put this movie out, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that wasn't the point. And so we encouraged everybody to go see the movie. And the one beef I have with the movie is that it ended... I mean, it has to end. It ended right at the time when we started to make all these changes. That's and right. one of the last scenes of the movie is our logo on a wall as Dr. Amala is walking into a meeting. Right. And, you know, I have a friend who I grew up with in Michigan who's now on our Mackey White Committee. He's a doctor um, and, and actually working to change um, and, and um, you know, fix some of these, these health and safety issues. And at the end of the day, football's football. You're going to have broken bones. And, but, yeah. but there's no reason um, that people shouldn't um, uh, have. And Dr. Amalo himself have treatment for these things. He, he says that he thinks, and he's optimistic, that there will be treatments for concussions. And it, it might be as simple as taking some version of, of Tylenol. And because his whole discovery is a protein buildup on the brain that happens, and right? And so, well, that's what CTE is, right? And right. so um, he said there, there might be ways to counteract that. But the only way you're going to know is if you research and 
um, fund research dedicated to trying to figure that out. And so I think we're down that path. We're, I don't think we're not even halfway there. Right. Um, but I think football will look a lot different um, 10, 15 years from now. Hmm. Now, I mean, like, do you see those same type of issues happening in other leagues? I mean, obviously, <clears throat> I think other sports are maybe arguably less physical, yeah. physically demanding. Yeah. Basketball, maybe hockey is maybe not the greatest in that, you know, yeah. uh, comparison. But it, do, do some of these same issues happen in other leagues as well? Yeah, I think so. And we've seen that yeah. um, in soccer, oddly, because of the headers. Oh, okay. Um, hockey as well with um, their the high speed. You know, they have very high speed collisions because yeah, of being on ice. Right. Um, and so I, I think everybody, the, the whole thing goes back to the welfare of the athlete. And, and I was talking about this morning, um, you know, Michigan State settling for $500 million last year, uh, last week with um, the gymnasts um, uh, uh, in, in that USA Gymnastics uh, doctor's case. Oh, right. And, and it, it all goes back to the welfare of athletes. Mm-hmm. And if you treat them as fungible Commodity. Commodity. Right. Yeah, if you commoditize them, That's right. then it leads to these, frankly, sickening results. And, and it could be pro football players where at least a lot of people uh, try to absolve themselves of any guilt by saying, well, you're paid well. So it's okay if you... Stop. Yeah, it's okay if you have dementia at 50. Right. Well, I don't know how you justify 14, 15, 16-year-old gymnasts because yeah. they're not paid yeah. and... They're 14, 15 year old gymnasts, right? right. So, um, but it all comes from the same mentality of right. athlete performance. We got to get them on the field or, or you know, uh, on the court and, and not treating them as human beings, which is really kind of core to our, uh, as a union. I mean, that, the thing we tell the players, I just told our rookies this last week in LA, the, everything we do in our building, mm-hmm. for profit side, non profit side, benefits, legal, IT. Um, all of our programming people, the one thing that unifies what we do is we're trying to help them each individually get more out of the fact that they play football for a living right. than, than football as an industry gets out of them. Wow. And for yeah. decades, it was the opposite. It was a cog in the machine, sucked you up, spit you out. Right. Yes, they paid you well. They didn't fully disclose the risks, right? Because it's one thing to say you're paid uh, well, right. But if you're you, you, the legal background, like if you're not disclosing all the risks, right. how can somebody make an informed choice? informed choice? And and so now you can say, look, okay, players from now on, they know can cut. Right. Okay, fine. And they're consenting to an X Y Z, right? And there will be people who who say, yeah, I'm willing to make that trade off, right? Um, and even for them, we want to say, well, if you have a concussion, please, <laughs> please do report it. And we're going to have we have independent sideline um, consultants. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have referees who are powered to empowered to stop games based on health and wellness of, of players, right? right. So um, these are all things that didn't exist. There's a return to play protocol uh, after a concussion. Mm. Um, didn't exist, you know, when the Will Smith movie came out. Right. And these were all things we, we spent a lot of time on um, because it's really important to, you know, not only our current players, but the future players. Right. Um, now, how much of that... So, like, the way these... Like, like, like take the NFL as an example the way the league is structured um what's the relationship between the league and then independently owned teams yeah like how much of it is top down like so for example if if, if the league passes these set of promulgates these rules and regulations uh do, do the teams have to abide by them yeah i mean the short answer is yes okay um although it it it's interesting it it the teams have create you know they've essentially ceded their individual power to the leagues and that's that's the way it works in most um, most pro sports leagues um, with some notable exceptions and okay. and there's antitrust laws that kind of impact that and so you can you know the 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 St Louis Rams moved to Los Angeles a few years ago that's right the league didn't want them to okay. but they're an independently owned and operated business right. and so Stan Kroenke who owns the um, the Rams and is married to Ann Walton, who's one of the Walton yep. um, family heiresses. Um, I believe she's the only owner uh, owner's wife who's own uh, is worth more than I think she's worth more than than he is. I would imagine. So. Um, wow. Yeah, um, which I think is uh, that's a cool fact. <laughs> yeah. um, but he was able right. to 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 move yeah. to to St. Louis, um, and and you know he had to get a vote of the ownership, but the league didn't get a vote, and the league preferred that both the 
Oakland Raiders and the San, San Diego Chargers move to LA. That's right. And keep the Rams in St. Louis. So that obviously didn't happen. So it's it's a it's a balancing act. And and I think over the decades, I mean not to like turn this into my sports law class mm-hmm. of old, but you know, there there was no commissioner of sports leagues okay. until the Black Sox scandal in 1919, the gambling scandal in baseball. And part of what baseball as as a league decided to do is hire a commissioner to kind of be like the impartial um, sheriff uh, and policing agent of the sport. And so they hired this former judge um, who was kind of like an impeccable lawyer, credential, law enforcement background. And he, um, he was the first commissioner of any sport and all the other leagues quickly followed. And what happened over time is the owners of the team said, well, you know, it seems to me that if I pay your salary and I can hire and fire you, then you're my employee, right? Mm-hmm. And and so it kind of ebbed into, well, this is like the hired CEO from the board of directors of the owners. Um, and then David Stern kind of turned that model and centralized power in, and, and I'm now friendly with David Stern, and um, it's an interesting relationship that he and I have um, and, and discussions we have about a lot of things. And but he turned that model into NBA centralized commissioner. NBA commissioner yeah, yeah, yeah. for yeah. thirty years. Thirty years, yeah, yeah. He he centralized that power, but then the owners kind of went back and said, "Well, you're not going to tell us what to do. We're going to tell you what to do." And and so, different relationship with the new NBA commissioner, different relationship with Roger Goodell. Where you know I do think it's more of a board of directors to a CEO model. Kind of model. Right. And so. Um, they do, by and large, have to abide by those rules. Otherwise, they can get fined. So mm. there was a big issue last year between the Dallas Cowboys and the league as it related to Ezekiel Elliott and, and the league suspending Ezekiel Elliott. Mm-hmm. And Jerry Jones, who's the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, right. fought them, fought the league, and um, ended up standing down. Well, they fined him $2 million, and he paid the fine. And they're all one big happy family, and <laughs> right. they had their meetings. And so yeah. it's, it's a really interesting... It, it, it's part board of director CEO, but yeah. part country club, right? Right. Where if the rule is you got to wear a tie, well, we're all wearing ties. Yeah. You know what I mean? And right. if we don't, there's some sort of like, you know, punishment. You know, that doesn't matter to the outside world, but maybe matters to us. You know, because <laughs> as members, yeah. Now yeah. we only get you know a small stake instead of a big stake. I, I don't know. <laughs> right, right, right. That's a good point. Now, now you mentioned gambling. You know, uh, obviously yeah. the other uh, big news. Yeah, the other big news uh, with the Supreme Court decision. Yeah. Uh, essentially, what legalizing? So it didn't legalize gambling. It it overturned a law that prohibited states correct from legalizing gambling. That's right. So. Um, That's a good point. That's a good nuance. Yeah, yeah and, and so what now is going to happen, and we've already started to see it, is like there's this mad dash where, by each of the out? states. Where did, this, where did the case come Jersey. From? New Jersey. Jersey. That's right. Yeah. It was a Chris Christie. It was uh, yes. part of the lasting legacy of Chris Christie, um, which I actually think this will be one of the one of the main things he's remembered for uh-huh. as governor of New Jersey, because he brought what was, frankly, a very long shot case um, appealing uh, or, or challenging uh, PASPA, yeah. which was the law that prohibited this. And uh, lost repeatedly and kept appealing to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court took it mm-hmm. over the objection of the federal government. The Solicitor General said, we don't think you should take this case. They took it, and by then, the writing was on the wall. I mean, right. why are you going to take it to just affirm what everybody's already said? Yeah. And so that was, for us, the wake-up call. And Adam Silver at the NBA had written a, a, an op-ed in the New York Times advocating for the legalization of sports gambling. Okay. Um, and... Um, so it's a game changer, I think, in terms right. of what... Because now it allows states to make that decision. Yeah, so it was already legal in Nevada. Of course. Um, but now each state can have their own version of the Nevada sports book. Yeah. Um, and take... Vegas. you know, And obviously gambling already happened. Um, and, and the Vegas odds, right, for anything, now can be... That's right. C- Cincinnati. Right, <laughs> right. Or, or San Francisco, right. And... Um, Gambling had happened, you know, there's a big gray black market for, for gambling. Mm-hmm. And so I think part of the the hope is that this will bring a lot of that into the daylight and, and have it be more regulated. Right. And, and, you know, I think the concern now isn't so much... It's an argument you often hear, like, when people talk about legalizing marijuana. Marijuana, marijuana absolutely. Example, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Minus the medicinal <laughs> Certainly. Uh, value. I don't think anybody can say they... <laughs> for gambling. It eases their pain to, yeah, to gamble on sports. But... Um, but 
the, the the thing that that it does have is it nobody's had good numbers on how much the illegal gambling has affected the outcomes right. of games, particularly right. overseas. Yeah. Um, but it, it's there. And I, I think not so much in a throwing games right. or even point shaving, but we call it like stat shaving or stat padding. Like, mm-hmm. how do you know that somebody didn't call a run in the fourth quarter in for a certain player in order to try to mm. give him a certain stat or a quarterback changes the play from a run to a throw in order to get who knows That's true. and and so but the more fantasy sports and daily fantasy and illegal gambling on those things and illegal gambling on the outcome of games was going on the more concern that was raising and so i think now that this is at least you're going to see more legalization of it at the state level yeah um the hope is that that will lead to you know greater focus on the integrity of the game and then obviously I think the hope is that it'll lead to increased revenue and increased increased interest in the games right. um, you know which is interesting for me as a Muslim to kind of be like well I don't I don't gamble right. <laughs> so I came here from Las Vegas and when we were in Las Vegas I told my folks I was like well I'm here in Ramadan and I don't drink I don't gamble um, I'm happily married and uh and it's Ramadan, and I'm on a diet, so uh, there's really nothing for me here That's in Las right. Vegas whatsoever. <laughs> you were at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's right. Think. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, uh, it's funny because we were talking about a mutual friend reaching out to us before the show, um, Zane Bengali, right? Yeah, who's yeah. a listener of the show, so I wanted to name drop his name. Um, and, and, you know, he, one of the things he was like, yeah, make sure you ask Ahmed about the fantasy football league that we're all part of. Oh, that's right. I was going to purposely avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. I am glad that Zane Bengali came up, though. That's, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, um, just because we named dropped. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Always. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Always. I've, I've known him uh-huh. since the early 90s, I think. Wow. Wow, you pre, yeah. So we, I met him in 97. Yeah. We were yeah. both freshmen at Michigan. Michigan. And then we lived together our junior year. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, you're, were you from where, Chicago? Was that Naperville? I grew up in Chicago. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, we were part of the same youth group, YMMA, oh, Young Men's so Association. Yeah. So I, uh, we were we were good friends there, and we've remained in, in contact uh, all these low these. I had no we idea. We should call. Up, we should like call him and just like patch him in right now. Get, get him <laughs> right now. Yeah. I because I I I mean I knew he listened to the show, but until he pinged me and you together this morning, I had no idea, no idea you knew him personally. Oh, that's that's what was like, that's and, you know, and so this I'm hearing this for the first time too. Yeah. There you go. We're learning yeah. all kinds. Yeah. Of wow. Right. I mean, because the Bengalis are like family. I mean, not only you know Zayn, but like Aisha and Ibrahim and Abid Uncle and Auntie, all of them, the whole family. Yeah. So just wonderful people all through and through. So nice. Well, this turned out well for him. <laughs> it did, it did. This is going to be the one episode that he shares with all of Yeah, exactly. Yeah, was, uh, no, listen to this. No reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's good yeah. stuff. No reason. <laughs> um, so as we kind of wind uh, things down, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of your time with the Players Association, I'm curious, what, what, are, what are some things that, uh, some truisms that you've, you've learned uh, about the human experience, about yourself, you know? Yeah, so um, I... I'm fond of saying that we work for a for-profit, like my people work for a for-profit, but we're not only for-profit. Hmm. And the thing that we do that gets most asked about by the players every single year is um, supporting their charity camps mm-hmm. in the off-season. So they do these skills clinics for kids, and most of them are underprivileged mm-hmm. kids in their hometowns. And so we get them video games and trading cards and apparel and drinks, you know, like sports drinks mm-hmm. and Gatorade. And and, um, and then this year we added, um, if the player wanted, uh, voter registration drives with um, uh, an organization called Spread the Vote um, that is our partner for that. And, and it was sort of our response to the Anthem stuff in a, you know, hey, this isn't partisan. Like, who, who's, you know, who could be opposed to um, uh, voter registration? Voter registration. Yeah. And it, to me, it just underscores the power of sports. And mm-hmm. even this year, and even sitting here on a day like today, um, we we just really firmly believe that sports is, is actually the world's best unifier of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I used to feel kind of guilty about that, um, saying that, because I thought, well, there's art, and there's music, and there's, right. there's religion, right? Which kind of cuts both ways. Right. Um, and then uh, I was invited to the Vatican for a conference on faith and sport. Wow. And Pope Francis said... 
Sports is the world's greatest unifier. And I was like, all right, I'm done. Like, I, I, I am good. If Pope Francis yeah. agrees, then then it must be true. And Although uh, the football he probably, maybe perhaps had mentioned is, is not American football. <laughs> except American football, yeah. Except American football. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm which I'm not sure he even uh, knows. Uh, he's like, Sorry. I saw that movie Concussion. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, not those guys. Those guys are screwed up. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, Sorry. Uh, and, and so, you know, like our business is just bringing companies... Um, yeah. Uh, closer or in contact with the power of sports yeah. and we do that um, uh, for probably close to 100 out of the fortune 500 companies that we work with in uh, some way shape or form we um, rolled out um, a program for the u.s women's national soccer team and the WNBA players the, the women uh, nba players women's basketball players where a lot of the the marketing and licensing stuff we do for football players mm. what we're doing for them now too and, and so sort of like this notion of representing athletes and diversifying beyond American football and looking internationally and doing things that are important to players, supporting like their voter registration drives and political activism in a way that isn't necessarily, you know, planting a Democrat, Republican, pro-Trump, anti-Trump flag in the ground, but it, it's, it's valuable to, to the players and to the athletes. And um, it's something that we can feel good about. And frankly... When I, whenever I leave this job um, by force or, or, or by choice, um, those will be the things that, that I'm the most proud of. And I'll never, ever forget a friend of mine who is in our fantasy football league uh, and is the doctor I was mentioning earlier on our, our Mackie White committee, a uh, guy by the name of Rami Kurdi. Um, he heard me talking to a group of, of people once at one of our events, and I, I made the joke, again, tongue-in-cheek, that, you know, we don't, we're, we're not saving lives here. Mm. And, and he pulled me aside after, and he's like, well, you know, I heard you say that. And he's like, what, what do you mean? And I was like, what do you mean? What do I mean? I mean, you're a doctor. You actually save lives. And I, you know, arguably play video games for, for a living. So <laughs> uh, what, what, what do you mean, what do I mean? Yeah. And, and he said, well, no. I mean, I, he said, I, I, as a doctor, might see one out of 100 of these people who are in the room right now yeah. at some point in their life. And he said, but you and, and what sports does mm-hmm. touches every single one of them. And he had a nurse who uh, works with him, whose husband is a former player, and he committed suicide. And he committed suicide by shooting himself in the chest in order to preserve his brain. Wow. And and you know he was he was older, but but yeah. you know he was affected by all. And this was post concussion oh, movie and all that. Right, right. And she now does a camp in his honor that we support and that Rami supports. And he was making the point that like every single one of those kids will forever be affected by football and sports and what we are doing with them and for them and what the athletes are doing for them right. for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And some of them, their lives might be saved by sports. And we hear these athletes talk about, you know, the fact that yeah. if I, if I wasn't playing sports, right. man, it was, it was a dark road Definitely. that I was going to be going down. So that really was eye opening and, and reaffirming of what we do. And it makes days like today where you're sort of like, it's very easy to hang our head and kind of say, man, what what are we doing? And we're all just getting steamrolled. And like, mm-hmm. what, what is this? Uh, it makes it easier because it is that perspective that I think at the end of the day, that's really all we're trying to do is, is, um, you know, bring people together and, and hopefully, um, make their lives better. Great. Nice. I think that's a great that, way to wrap things up. All right. Uh, yeah. On a happy note. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I'm glad we were finally able to get this, uh, on wax, as uh, as Azar Osman likes to say, <laughs> um, and, and so thank you for making that happen. I know yeah. it's been a busy travel week for you, and so to carve out an hour and to sit with us, uh, we really want to yeah, we really appreciate that. How can maybe people um, reach out to you if there is a way you know that you, that you don't mind sharing? If people want to ask you questions, we've got you know maybe listeners want to pursue a career in law or. Yeah, sports, sports law in particular. Uh, maybe. Is Twitter okay? Is yeah, that an okay place anything, to say that? anything. Yeah. Instagram, Twitter, yeah. email, you name it. Snail mail, <laughs> if you feel. Snail mail is <laughs> probably the best bet of me actually seeing it. Email is the worst. <laughs> um, probably not a good idea to give my my yeah, cell phone I number know. out. So yeah, Twitter. Uh, my my uh, Twitter handle is um, Ahmed Nassar Biz. So A H M A D. N A S S A R B I Z, all kind of one thing. Right. So the the Ahmed Nassar is all A's. Yeah. So don't put any E's in there. And then That's Biz B I Z. It's a good way to remember it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Zaki, why don't you close this out? Tell us where. Tell our listeners where they can send thoughts, questions, uh, comments. 
Yeah, you can email us at uh, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence, and send any messages there. Also, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Leave a star rating. Every little bit helps. And if you're looking for me, you can find me at my website, zakiscorner.com. That's Z-A-K-I-S Corner. It's also my Twitter and my Instagram. And for Viz? Hey, I'd be remiss not to say it's the month of Ramadan where we are instructed. I'm going to kind of usurp a little religious language here to be charitable, and, 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 and we are in need of, of charitable contributions, so if you want to uh, support the podcast, support the arts, uh, support what we do, um, then please visit our Patreon page. So it's patreon.com slash diffuse congruence. You can become a monthly patron, and um, we would thank every little contribution that you can make. There you go. And with that, uh, thank you so much for listening. We will catch you next time. <laughs>